course with the CNS that he led for many, many years. It was a four day 3D anatomy course that was a combination of him talking and talking and showing 3D pictures and then going to the lab and practicing the, uh, the operative report uh, procedures. And um, I, uh, I did that for three years, I mean, sorry, six years after he um, uh, had had enough. And it was a real uh, privilege, a real honor to kind of carry on in his, uh, in his uh, legacy. And it was um, particularly nice for me just to have the opportunity to listen to his um, incredible wealth of knowledge. And, um, and I really uh, was as, as eager as all the students, all the residents in the audience uh, during all those lectures. Um, well, what I thought, um, what I've been asked to do is talk about innovations in cerebral revascularization. So um, let me just get right to it since um, it's Saturday night here in Phoenix and it's getting late. Um, these, um, these are my uh, statistics and um, you can see for yourself, I've um, been blessed to have a very focused practice that has uh, allowed me to do many bypasses. And um, um, when it comes to aneurysm treatments, this uh, illustration is just meant to say that for most aneurysms, we can, um, we can do our nice subarachnoid dissections, we can ex expose the pathology, uh, and then we can clip these things um, fairly routinely. Um, but when it comes to giant aneurysms or aneurysms that are complex, I think um, uh, it raises the question, are large aneurysms best treated like regular aneurysms? Uh, and I think the aneurysm is no. Um, and uh, is a completely uh, different, are these a completely different entity requiring a different strategy? And I think the answer to that is yes. Um, that strategy is bypass. And this is a great example. This is a um, dolichoectatic middle cerebral aneurysm. You can see I clipped it um, with this picket fence, but here's the five-year follow-up showing a, a, a reconstruction of the um, recurrence of the aneurysm. <laughs> Sorry about that. My dog is keeping me company here and she just saw something outside. Uh, anyway, there's the, um, there's the bypass that we're gonna do. This is a, um, what I call a middle communicating uh, bypass. We're creating a communication between the trunks of the middle cerebral artery in order to allow the trunks to, to um, communicate. So this is a view of the external carotid artery. This is a radial artery graft going in. And now it's been tunneled up to the sylvian fissure and we're back up in the sylvian fissure. This is the uh, temporal trunk off of the aneurysm. And so the graft is gonna be re-implanted to um, that trunk. The graft is only long enough to get to one of the two trunks. So I um, basically uh, supplied the, um, the temporal trunk. And then um, this shows you patency in the, in the graft. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna repurpose the stump of that temporal division by cutting it off of the aneurysm and transposing it over to the frontal division, which you see over here with the purple line. So the, the dead end of that temporal trunk becomes a donor for the frontal division. This is the interluminal suture line you can see here. And uh, here's the completed construct. This creates this middle communicating artery in an analogous way to the anterior communicating or the posterior communicating that joins the MCA trunks and allows them to redistribute the flow on the backside of this aneurysm, which is now here being distally occluded. So there's the flow now. We've got all of the trunks being supplied by the interposition graft. And, and that's a nice way to, um, to rebuild this. It's, it's meant to prove the point that for these really complicated cases, um, the clip constructs aren't necessarily the answer and you need to resort to the bypasses. You can see here, this um, is uh, the percentage of bypasses in my overall aneurysm experience and the percentage of bypasses in the giant aneurysm experience. You can see it's 5% jumps to nearly half for the giants. So um, I, I spent a lot of time a few years ago putting this book together and the purpose of the book was really to see if we can't um, innovate and evolve the craft of bypass surgery. I wanted to do a couple of things. I wanted a, a system of symbols so that we could create um, what I call blueprints. 
I wanted a taxonomy for bypasses so that we could really go down the list, the menu for our different choices. And I wanted to um, push these intracranial to intracranial techniques. And the metaphor I like to use is architecture. Uh, this is um, from my days in San Francisco and you can see this beautiful Golden Gate Bridge. It's, it's more than just a bridge. It was meant to not only connect Marin County to the city of San Francisco, but it makes a statement about um, what a, um, an engineering construct can look like, how it can become this, um, this beautiful thing. And um, it really is um, uh, a, a, a work of art. And I think the same thing can be said of the uh, Freedom Tower in New York, which has come to represent something more than just a building. It's, it's a symbol of American resilience after a terrorist attack. We can say the same things about the Basilica La Sagrada in, in Barcelona with what Gaudí has brought, the elements that he's brought into this architecture with the parabolas and the branch columns. You can say the same about Utsan's um, Sydney Opera House with the design that he used to create the feeling of a ship on the water. Or Frank Gehry with his uh, museum in Bilbao. All of these things are taking some architectural project and elevating them to an art form. And I think um, when I reflect on what we can do with bypass surgery, we have a similar opportunity to not just replumb the arteries, but to make an artistic statement. And, um, and that's really what I will focus on in this talk is just bringing creativity, bringing personality and passion into the, the art of the bypasses that we do. Now, um, having built this house in Phoenix, um, I came to the conclusion that architects and construction workers use blueprints. It's the way that you communicate the vision and the details from one um, group to the next and you ensure that you get the, uh, the construct right. Um, and, and here you can see after all the construction is done, how it's so vitally important that you have these blueprints. Well, when, when I, reflected on bypass surgery, it was clear to me that we really don't have blueprints and yet we could really use them. And so these are um, the symbols that um, I developed with my artist, uh, the different wiring diagrams for the cerebral circulations, the different symbols for the anastomosis, the different symbols for the, um, for the graphs and the uh, different um, things that we use, symbols for the different pathology. And with these, uh, you can capture the construct that you're trying to build. Now this is a, a little video just to show how um, we're building this, um, this app where you can go to our, our website, you can get on this app and you can just do these clip um, drag and drops and start building these uh, schematics for yourself. Um, they're really handy. Um, they allow you to kind of map out or plan out your design for your bypass. And it's a great way to communicate um, your plan to the team, or it's a great way for you as the, as the architect to sort of refine your design. And um, you know, the, the difficulty with these um, symbols sometimes is that they're just hard to, to draw out. And the purpose of this little project is to bring these to you so that everybody can access this algorithm and use these drawings in a way that, um, that um, uh, creates these. So in any event, this is just a little, little example. Um, um, this is an example of an A1 to M2 double reimplantation bypass. You can see here's the donor site. These are the two recipient sites. I guess it would be a D1 R2 bypass in the Marcos terminology. Uh, but here's a great way to use this um, schematic to, uh, to capture that um, plan. Now this is a paper, uh, one of the few, if um, maybe the only that I wrote with Dr. Rotan, uh, where we completed his work on um, developing a nomenclature for the segmental anatomy. Uh, I think he did a, a wonderful job with um, all of the cerebral vessels, but um, didn't uh, have a new, an alphanumeric code for the cerebellar vessels. And just by completing these alphanumerics over here, we now have a nomenclature that has really an alphanumeric address for every segment of the cerebral vasculature. And the reason that's important is that when you're trying to um, build this bypass, you can represent it schematically in this blueprint here. 
as I've shown you, or you can use the alphanumeric code and you can capture everything that you need to know in that code. So this is that A1 to M2 double reimplantation bypass. And just by using the alphanumeric code, you can go from this pathology to this reconstruction here. And everybody who looks at that code should know exactly how to build that bypass. So it's a real, it's a nice way to create shorthand and to make sure that everybody's on the same page and understands uh, what you're trying to accomplish. Now, um, in my mind, um, I like to categorize or think of bypasses in these groups of seven. Um, and I'll just quickly walk you through. The first group is the ECIC bypasses, your standard scalp artery bypass, the Yasser-Gill bypasses, the occipital artery or the temporal artery bypasses. Um, those are the first category or the first generation. Uh, the second category, the second generation are these higher flow ECIC interpositional bypasses that use the carotid and the neck as your donor. Um, the next four categories are all of the intracranial to intracranial bypasses. And these are either reimplantations, in situ bypasses, reanastomotic bypasses, or these short intracranial jump grafts. These four um, categories comprise the ICIC bypasses. The seventh um, category is a combination bypass. And that could be any combination of any of the above. It could be two ECIC bypasses. It could be two ICIC bypasses or any, any mixture of the above. And these are the seven bypasses that I think um, help organize your thinking when it comes to making your choices. I think you have to start with just um, a classification. You have to look at, you know, where is the aneurysm? What pathology are you specifically dealing with? Once you have that uh, clearly in mind, then you can go to um, your menu of options. This is the seven bypasses here on the uh, left here. And on the top here, you can see the different classifications of the aneurysms. And if you just work your way down the grid, you can look at the different options that you have available to you. And further, you can go down these algorithms and you can ask critical questions and you can work your way to uh, selecting the very best uh, bypass option for the particular pathology. So here's an example. This is a um, dolichoectatic middle cerebral aneurysm. You can see uh, the exposure in the sylvian fissure. As we come down, you, you'll see the giant aneurysm here. You'll see the uh, frontal division here and the temporal division over there. And we bring all of this pathology nicely into view. And um, here both trunks are seen on the backside of this aneurysm. And so for this one, um, I'm going to use this A1 as the, uh, as the donor site. And so I've come to appreciate the A1 as an excellent donor. You can see how it sits right next to the carotid terminus. It's able to um, uh, recruit uh, very high flows, and it's also very accessible at the very bottom of the sylvian fissure. So this is all very uh, routine now. We've seen a lot of video here, so I'll just quickly show you the completion of this um, donor uh, A1 uh, anastomosis. Once that's in place, we complete that, and then we can run the graft up the sylvian fissure. And this is where it gets interesting. Here now you'll see our uh, saphenous vein graft, you'll see the uh, frontal division coming out the aneurysm. And this is now going to be a side-to-side -side anastomosis.